I want to tell you a little bit here about Frank Laubach um, because he's such a beautiful illustration of learning to interact with God and learning uh, how to, to really let God's thoughts replace your thoughts. Uh, Frank Laubach was a Presbyterian missionary in the Philippines back uh, in the 30s. And uh, it's in a, he has it's an interesting story how, how he got there, but he wound up out in an area of the Philippines where there's a tribe called the Moros tribe. They're a very uh, strong uh, Islamic uh, tribe. And uh, Frank was out there alone as a missionary among these people. And he began to think about Islam. And you know the word Islam uh, really means submission. And uh, I don't, no need to comment on that at great length as to what it means and how it works out. But Frank Laubach began to think the question, how would it be if I were able to submit myself to God moment by moment? If I were able to turn my mind to God, and uh, Frank Laubach was actually a well-educated man, and he realized that you can, things don't disappear from your mind immediately. They stay there for a while. And uh, in staying there, they continue to affect you. And so here's what he decided to do. Uh, he decided that he would try to turn his mind back to God in some way, uh, every once a minute, once a minute. Maybe it would just be the singing of a hymn or looking at a symbol of a cross or maybe he would just murmur to himself, hallowed be thy name or something of that sort. And so uh, Laubach chose to think on God. And now this, this is the heart of our teaching tonight. This is something we must choose to do and then learn how to do it. We can keep God present before our minds. If we want to. We have to choose that. And Frank Laubach chose to do this. And so what he did was he started out uh, just sort of keeping a little awareness of how his mind would turn to God and then he'd continue with his business. And you know, you can think of many things at the, one time, at the same time. You know that? And uh, so you can, you can turn your mind to God and it won't get in the way of what you're doing. Now many of you know this because of how you drive. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's another story. Okay. But it's true, isn't it? You can do a number of things at the same time. And so... It's a matter of habit, of learning. If you're worried about something, you do it without habit. You just worry about it. You see, you keep thinking about it no matter what you're doing. But now what Laubach found was that you can actually turn your mind back to God every minute or so. And that that will keep God in your consciousness and allow you, as David says in the psalm, Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. When he had practiced this experiment for a while, it really began to transform his life. Here's what he said after four weeks. Okay, now I want to pause on that. Four weeks. Because, you know, if you say four weeks, my goodness, can I do that? Well, you're going to spend four weeks anyway. <laughs> All right? Four weeks from now, it'll be four weeks later. <clears throat> Isn't that profound? Yeah. Okay. So see, that's where choice comes in. The choice here is, what do I really want to accomplish in my life with God? What do I really want to accomplish? Would I like to have constantly the sense of walking with the great Lord who is my shepherd? You see, he will, he will not force his presence on you. Sometimes that happens, but you cannot count on it. And that's because he will not compete for your attention. He's not competing. He says, seek me, for you shall find me when you seek me with all your heart. 
Now see, that's something for you to do. Go back to last week's lesson. That doesn't mean you have to do it on your own. You don't have to do it on your own. But on the other hand, it does mean it will not be done for you. And Frank Laubach took that seriously. And, and uh, I, if you have time to read his uh, little book called Letters from a Modern, Modern Mystic, he wrote letters back to his father uh, in, I think, New York. And his father published the letters in a little magazine. And then these were collected later. It's just a record of how his life was transformed. And uh, here's what he says after four weeks. Quote, I feel simply carried along each hour doing my part in a plan which is far beyond myself. This sense of cooperation with God in little things is what so astonishes me. For I never have felt it this way before. I need something and turn around to find it waiting for me. I must work to be sure, but there is God working along with me. Does that sound good? See, that is for us, but it requires that we transform our mind by keeping it constantly turned towards God. It requires the habit. Now, to most of us have a habit of thinking of something else. And now the real question is, uh, wouldn't we be better off to have the habit of thinking of God? I think you know the answer to that question. And so the point then is to choose what we will think of. And that is the first freedom that comes to us. Even a person chained to a wall in a prison can choose what they're going to think of. And people who are in those conditions learn quickly that it's going to be the difference between going crazy or staying sane. And they learn how to work with their minds to keep themselves alive. And to keep themselves from being eaten up with anger and hatred and loneliness. They learn how to direct their mind. And that's just at a human level. I think God hears prisoners. And I think he helps them. But when we turn ourselves loose to God, we say, now, at my office, in my home, wherever I am, whatever's happening, I'm going to have God before my mind. That's a choice. And if we want, going back to those circles, if we want to see progress in all those circles, we have to focus on the mind. Now, why is that so? Well, you see, the will can only work in terms of the mind. You make your choices in terms of your thoughts and your feelings. So what you choose will be determined by what you think. Now, interestingly enough, what we've seen here tonight is what you think may be determined by what you choose. So you have to choose to think of God. And then thinking of God will enable you to choose differently with reference to everything else. Do you see how that fits the description now? Change me on the inside. And spiritual growth is not designed to solve particular problems, but it does. See, now that's the difference, for example, between uh, AA program. See, AA program is very specific, and I'm not in any way criticizing it or knocking it. Because if you've got a problem with alcohol, you need help. And uh, the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous program or similar programs are designed to modify your behavior. And they do it very effectively because they understand the sources of behavior. They do it very effectively. But you can be sober and still be a miserable person. <laughs> right? See, what we want is indirection, indirection. We change the thinking, feeling, social, body, all those 
dimensions, and then the behavior takes care of itself. That's what Paul means when he says, love fulfills the law. See, if you're living out of love, you don't have to say, well, shall I steal or not? That doesn't come up. Doesn't come up. And now, I want to emphasize at this point what I said last night, that what you want to do, or last week, was if we're going to deal with behavior, what we want to do is stay out of even the thought. And the way to stay out of the thought is through the renewal or transforming of the mind. Now, let's be honest with it. Not everybody can. Some people are so in bondage to their thinking they can't break out. And typically the person who, as Paul says, is dead in trespasses and sins is the person who can't even think the right thoughts. And that's why it's so important that as a church here and wherever your church is, it's so important that you tell people about Jesus Christ. You tell people about God. You bring knowledge to them. You bring light. You bring information and challenge them to act upon it. Not to accept it uncritically or thoughtlessly, it won't do any good. You say to people, here's what I think, here's what's happened, now why don't you try that? And let them put it into practice. And then things begin to change, you see. So, um, some people, even if they're told, can't help. And that's why, as I say here, often ministry is required of others who have the character and power of Christ and can go to an individual and pray with them and lift a burden that they can't manage on their own. So some people aren't free. There's a second problem though, and the second problem I think is going to be the one that would perhaps trouble most of us. Do we really want this? And I pause just so that we can reflect on it. Do we want a mind filled with God? You see, that really challenges so much that is in us. Because if I fill my mind with God, there are other things I can't fill it with. And perhaps I don't want to let go of that just yet. Now, last, night I, uh, last week I said at the opening of the session that everything that is held out in the scriptures uh, and in the people of God as an ideal can be realized and can be realized by anyone who will seek it. So all of the things that Jesus said, they're possible. They're good for you. They're good. can be done. Um, I'm reminded of a saying by a, a man named Surin, who was asked, why when so many people talk so much about spiritual growth, there's so little of it? And he said, because people pay too much attention to insignificant things. See, that's a way of saying they let their mind be distracted into other things. And that is the curse of human life. Uh, but what lies back of it is, well, I'm not sure I really want this. Uh, did you get a little bored with the 23rd Psalm? You didn't. Okay, good. See, sometimes people say, why am I saying this? Well, that's normally when they have backed off of putting themselves into it. And they're just sort of rattling off the words. And their heart is not in it. And we're wedded to our ways of thinking. We're wedded to ideas about what we really want and what we really need. What's important and what isn't important. And to say, I want to fill my mind with God. I want to retain God in my knowledge. See, that, that's a statement from Paul in Romans 1, where he's, he's trying to account for how people have turned away from God. 
and they refuse to retain God in their knowledge. Because, well, they wanted other things. And you know the universe is probably not big enough for two gods. So I push God away. Um, there's some things that come up here. Uh, the Psalm 1 type of person, um, you remember uh, this person was a man who delighted in the law of God and uh, he just stayed with meditation on it day and night. Um, he didn't stand in the counsel of the ungodly. Um, he avoided the path of sinners. Uh, he did not sit in the seat of the scoffer. Now, I think that's a kind of pro progression because if you live in the counsel of the ungodly, it's going to move you into the path of sinners. And as you become sinful, you're going to scoff at righteousness. So I think it's a kind of progression there. And you see a lot of that. But notice this man, um, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Well, that's the Psalm 1 person. The law of the Lord is the teaching about the nature of God, what God has done. It isn't just the Ten Commandments. In biblical terms, the law refers to the first five books of the Bible. And it's an account of how God came into human life and how he wants to be a part of that. And then Psalm 23 is a reflection of what happens uh, when that uh, uh, takes place, you see. And then the person who delights in But now notice he delights in it. He delights in it. Uh, there's so much in the Psalms about the law as a wonderful treasure, uh, as something that is better than gold, sweeter than honey. Uh, all those wonderful phrases about the law of God. And you have to think now, well, if it's that delightful, then perhaps I could give up my other ways of thinking and let my mind be full of that. See, something is going to be in your mind. And if it's the person of Jesus, or the law, or the good things that God has done for you. Those are very important to keep before your mind. See, then your whole being will respond to that. But if you pull those out, something else will take their place. You know, the big brouhaha over the Ten Commandments now. Right? Well, you see, there's, a, uh, there's an issue here of whether or not uh, the Ten Commandments represent something very important. Some people are sure they do. Others think, no, I mean, they're not important. See, that's what lies back of the so-called separation of church and state. I mean, there are many important issues there. But on the side of those who want to do things like put the Ten Commandments out of our consciousness, there really is the idea that this is, these are not good things. These people don't delight in the law of the Lord, right? They don't delight. Now, what they don't often recognize is if you take them away, something else takes its place. What is it? There's not going to be a vacuum. People are going to live by something. Charles Colson tells a story about being in a high school to speak where they had a problem with theft. And Colson said, well, why don't you put up a sign that says thou shalt not steal? Good idea. Now, if you don't have there, what, what, is in it, what is in its place? And this is a serious, serious problem for us today. We keep the person of Jesus there, the righteousness of the law, then other things are pushed out. Now, here's the problem. Do we really want those other things? What would I be like if my mind was just full of the law of God and delight in the law of God. If it were just full of images of Christ. If I, if I was constantly looking for him to be present in my life. What, what would my life be like? Well I can tell you it would be wonderful. But see I have to deal with this problem of whether or not that is something I might like to take a little vacation from. See? 
And there's something very deep here. Uh, it has to do with this idea that, well, I will lead my life. And I think there's something God-given and healthy about that. The problem is that I have been raised up to think that if I'm going to lead my life, I have to put God's life aside. And so this problem of, am I cornered? Can I still sin if I want to? Now, let me surprise you. You can. You can. Because that's what God is really after, is allowing you to live with him in such a way that your wanter is changed. Right? And that is a process. That is a process that I have to work that through until I become so sure that I really don't want to sin. That it's no longer something that, well, that'd be real nice if I could just get away with it. No, no, it really isn't nice. It's really bad. It's really bad for you. And that's what we have to learn, is go through that process of, of uh, changing uh, our wanter. You know, I could stick that pin in my eye. I could do that. I'm not going to prove it. But I could. I could. Now, why don't I do it? I really don't want to. <laughs> I really don't want to. Now, think of that same thing. Imagine, I mean, you're living so fully in the presence of the Lord. I mean, you really have got him right here. He's with you. He's at your right hand. And when you are settled in the goodness of that, you feel the same way. You say, I could sin, sure. People get worried about God. They say, could God sin? I get that question often on college campuses. Could God sin? And I always, I, I tell them what I believe, which is very surprising to them. And that is, of course he could. He can do anything. And then their next question is, why doesn't he? Because they're still thinking that it would be a rather good thing. And if you're a god, you could get away with it. Right? And my answer is always the same. He's too smart. The same reason I don't stick the pin in my eye. See, now, that's the kind of understanding that God wants to bring us to. And what I want to say to you this evening is when we're moving into that, it's okay to feel a little uneasiness. Like this is going to wipe out your personality or something. Right? <laughs> That's, it's okay to feel a little uneasy about that. We have to learn how that works. And we have to learn that it's really by entering into the goodness of God and his kingdom and knowing the action of God with you as you go through day by day, it's only that way that you feel comfortable. You, don't, you, you, you break the habit. Uh, you, the God world is not where you've learned to be comfortable in your life. And that all changes in time as the habits of the mind change. But for a while, we'll have to pray now that God will help us think like we don't necessarily want to think. And we have to make efforts to change that, see. We have to will and to pray. You know, sometimes you're not willing, but you're willing to be willing. Do you know that? And that's, that's really honest, good place to work with God. I'm not willing to let us say, return evil, good for evil. Maybe someone has really done something very mean to me. And I'm not really willing, but I can say to God, Lord, I'm willing to be made willing. I'm willing. And so we pray and 
we begin to think differently. And for example, if we get our vision right and our thoughts right with God, we can say quite honestly, look, I'm not bothered by what people can do to me. I will take reasonable steps about that. I might put the lock on my door, but I'm not going to trust the lock. I'm going to trust God. And that's the normal pattern of life for the person whose mind has become absorbed. So for health, I'll be reasonable, do the things that are good for health, but I will trust God. If I have an affliction, I'm not just going to go to the doctor, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to come to the fellowship of the church and ask them to pray for me. And I'm going to hope that they have learned how to do that so that they really know how to move with God to make a difference in my world, you see. That's what it means to say the Lord is my shepherd. It means I do the things that I know are right and good, but my trust is in the Lord. And in order to have that trust in the Lord, my thoughts have to be absorbed in him, caught up within him. So that no matter what is happening, no matter what I'm doing, there's always, as Frank Laubach found, there's always the Lord right there. Sometimes I go through the day just thinking of the cross on this side and the open tomb on this side. That's an image. See, you, you need to use redeemed images to help you move along in that way. Now, our feelings can stop us. And that is what is apt to happen. We have to talk about those next time. It's a huge issue in the spiritual life, is feelings. And that's the other part of our mind. And if we're going to have renewal of the mind, as Paul speaks of it, we have to deal with that. But in the meantime... Let's practice directing our minds to God as best we can. I want to encourage you to continue to work with the 23rd Psalm. Now, if you, of course, if you uh, want to go on to other Psalms or other, port, that's fine. But as you work with that Psalm this week, I'd like you to focus on this statement from Paul. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. Now that's going to put tension on your mind. So last uh, Wednesday, uh, after exhorting you on Tuesday, uh, as I went from my office to my car on the USC campus, I realized I had lost my keys. And so I had to scramble around and, and how to cope with that. Now, I, because I had told you to uh, do the 23rd Psalm and I do what I tell people, uh, I was in very good company. And I, I enjoyed that and the, worked out and everything came out right. And, and, but you see, the difference was my experience as I went through that. And walking around in the dark, and the neighborhood there around USC <laughs> is an opportunity. <laughs> it's an opportunity. See, it is. So now, be thankful. You can be thankful. What are you going to be thankful for? You're going to be thankful for God. You're going to be thankful for God. You're going to be thankful that wherever you are, you're in his care. And so this week, would you please put together the 23rd Psalm, uh, Romans 5, 8, all these other verses uh, that I've mentioned here, they're very good. God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and so on. Work with your mind is what I'm saying. Work with your mind, and then use as a focus giving thanks. In, now, it doesn't say give thanks for everything. It says in everything. In everything. So when you got something you can't be thankful for, in it, in that situation, you can still be thankful. And who knows, maybe you'll even wind up being thankful for that. Right? What you couldn't be thankful for. All right, well then, keep this in mind then, that the path forward towards the healing of the heart 
means the renovation of the mind. And that means that the images and thoughts, the teachings of the scripture about God and your world now come in and occupy your mind. And that lays a foundation for your will to act differently. And then we'll progress on to the rest of the story uh, next week. So let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you for your wonderful, beautiful teachings. Uh, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for the presence of the word upon the earth. We ask that you would give to each person here this evening just exactly what they individually can profit from. But lift our hearts in hope and joy and peace because we know the Good Shepherd. In whose name we pray. Amen.